Flipper Baby Productions presents the Cinema Shame Podcast. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I think it was the first time people really took science fiction seriously. He wasn't content with just making a good science fiction movie. Kubrick and always had to push the envelope. He would tell me the last couple of years of his life when we were talking about the form. He kept saying, I want to change the form. I want to make a movie that changes the form. And I said, well, didn't you do that with 2001? This is the Cinema Shame Podcast, the safe space for the penitent movie watcher. My name is James Patrick. My guest today is the delightful Stephanie Crawford, who made her first appearance on the podcast last year to talk about A Clockwork Orange. Stephanie's a writer and co-host of the Screamcast podcast, and you can check out all of her wonderful work at scrawford.typepad.com. Find her on the Twitters at Scrawfish. And our movie of the day is Encino Man. Woo! Woo, Encino Man! (laughs) I like how you turn that Earl and or Earl, U-R-L, <laughs> into one word. It's like S. Crawford. That seems professional, but you just... Scrawford. Scrawford, it, yeah. That's I find cool. that sticks that's in your brain more. The more syllables you add, the harder it is for people to <laughs> log it up in their brain. All right. You're the expert, apparently. I am. All Absolutely. right. So Encino Man. You hadn't seen Encino Man before. I can't believe it. Yeah, I actually thought it was a movie I grew up with and loved, but you pitched it so aggressively. Right. Uh, I, I learned otherwise. It's it's a good thing that you you know decided to not have seen it at such a very late moment. Yeah, I thought that was particularly thoughtful of me. I'm a team player, right? Yeah. Brendan Fraser, best cinematic caveman. <sighs> I'm going to say yes. He goes on a real hero's journey. Mm -hmm. He has a makeover montage, which I think is key. Mm -hmm. Uh, Absolutely. Right. Though I will say not the best DeLuise brother in this film. That's probably true. I mean, is there anybody really close, though, in in the entire pantheon of caveman cinema? I'm really struggling to come up with with a rival here. Hmm. Well... Yeah, I I don't think there's any notable person who's ever played a caveman. I think they're just kind of faceless, grunty boys. Or... We, we had we had we had Ringo Starr, uh, Dennis, oh, Dennis, Dennis Quaid, and right. Barbara Bach in uh, Caveman. Well, that's a genuine cinema shame for me. So, how would you rate those caveman performances? Um, uh, the grunting is second to none. Because there's no dialogue, right. in, there's no dialogue in that movie. It's grunting. That's important. It is. Um, caveman need to grunt. Yeah, I'm really drawing a blank there. I mean, does does one million BC count? I mean, that's not really. The thing is, there's so many films. If there's going to be cavemen, they're kind of playing second fiddle. They're e- either playing second fiddle to a furry bikini outfit right. or really cool dinosaurs. And yeah, it was the dinosaurs. I was thinking. I always have this image of them throwing spears at, at stop motion dinosaurs. They're not. Yeah. They're kind of faceless. You're right. There's there's not. They're really just that dressing. Yeah, that's a shame. Well, that concludes our conversation about Encino Man. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Anytime. This, this, this great. is we'll great. To, yeah, we'll we'll do this again sometime. <sighs> that was good. I think that went well. Yeah. I did hear something that I wanted to talk about with you. It just, just came to me right oh, now. Okay. I I heard that you just watched Stanley Kubrick's 2001 for the first time. 2001 Space Odyssey? That's the one. The the one the the, the 1968 movie that changed worlds. Yeah. Lives. Boy, the hands yeah. sure are clucking. Yeah, it's true. So uh why did why did that take you so long? 
You know, I thought about that. On one hand... Was it the monkeys? I bet it was the monkeys. I love monkeys. And I love monkeys on film. However, I knew there were sounds like a bad Duran Duran song. Or the best, most underappreciated Duran Duran song. This is why we never agree on anything. I, I say it's black, you say it's white. But they aren't real monkeys. They're people in, albeit great, but they're in costumes. Except for so. the li- except for the little ones. Yeah, but you know, okay. And the tapers, they weren't. They were. They were real tapers and not suits. Those are fun to see, actually. Yeah. Until it gets clubbed. But go on about your experience with 2001, please. Especially. Oh, okay. Well, this was actually. I I think I would say it's one of my dad's favorite films. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's one that would was in constant rotation, and I would just walk in, um, and I'd be like, wow, that looks compelling, or that looks complex. And I don't think I ever walked in on dialogue, not once. That's probably probably true. Yeah, so I think there's part of me that's wondering if it was like a weird silent film, or, you know, my, my dad watched a, a, a lot of strange films. Um, as I got older and I learned it was actually an incredibly famous landmark film, I was like, oh, of course, my dad, he is a physicist. And um, he oh, so he's has... a smart one, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> the apple fell really far from the tree oh. with us. <laughs> um, no, honestly, I, I just think I was very intimidated by it. And it's one of those films a lot like a clockwork orange actually where you start seeing it referenced and parodied, especially on my favorite show of all time, the Simpsons. Mm -hmm. And I think there was part of me that thought like, eh, you know, I've heard the quotes. I've seen the parodies. I think I get the gist of it. You know, I think I've basically seen this movie. I think I'm okay. Mm -hmm. So the star, just, the star baby made perfect sense before, before then, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Especially when it was Homer, like mm-hmm. that really spoke to me. I, I do get that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think it was intimidation and then it's just such a huge influential chunk of pop culture that I convinced myself I absorbed it by osmosis. Mm-hmm. So what about you? When did you first watch this? I have a, a similar story, except mine mine ended with me watching it when I was 10. My dad was a huge fan. And we must have had it on VHS. That was, de- that was definitely one he would have owned. And uh, I'm sure he he said, we're going to watch this now. It's going to be great. And I said, oh, okay, because, you know, at 10, I was going to watch anything. And I watched it at 10 and said, that was something. And... <laughs> that was about it. Uh, it wasn't until I watched it again, I would say probably about 17 or 18, that I um, understood it to the point where I, I felt competent enough to have a conversation with someone about 2001. And then I'm in in college. I, we had I had a directed wrote and directed a sketch comedy show, so we naturally did a 2001 parody sketch where a computer lab attendant spoke to all his computers and mm-hmm. he threatened to shut them all down like that. That was, that was, wow. the ex- that was the extent to which I was really invested in the 2001 story at that point was using that particular part. Um, but it wasn't until the third time that I watched it, that I really felt I understood it and grasped what Stanley Kubrick wanted to do with this movie and contemplated it as something beyond face value imagery. So <laughs> broadly, broadly speaking, <laughs> as I choke on my tea, <laughs> that's not the same as the explosion. I didn't know. I said something so shocking. I apologize. Uh, well, you know, it's not quite the explosion that would, would boost the ratings, but it's something. Uh, did, did the full movie uh, somehow you know, live up the expectations. You said it was one of your dad's favorite movies. You've seen some of it now piecing it all together. What, what did you realize about your expectations? I was an idiot. Well, I which, was which, which presumptuous presumptuous. 
Flat out jerk. Ooh. Yeah. And you think by now, I would know that you can't piece together an entire movie by a couple of clips from some comedy shows and comedy sketches from college. And Yeah, no. Yeah, you can't do it. Especially not a Stanley Kubrick movie. <laughs> no, nope. absolutely not. Um, no, because it's such, like most of his films, it's so visually striking. You see the imagery everywhere. And I assume that uh, I, I pretty much saw the the biggest set pieces, the really the show stoppers, especially at the time. And I, I was shocked by how staggering the visual side, the visuals that I had never seen before were. Um, it's it's it, pretty it, remarkable what he put into that in terms of the production values and the, the it, set design and. And the way it all came together and some of the visual tricks he used to create those effects. And considering how minimal some of the shots were. Yeah. No, and it makes me kind of mad at so many films that are set in space that are so sterilized. Um, this certainly has that, but in it fits the plot. There are areas that should be sterilized, but everything still has personality it's still very unique it's very uniquely him and there's even like rococo influences in this movie and just amazing pops of color there's a sense of humor in some of the costumes and you can tell thought went into every teeny little bit and it does make a difference i read that he there was a he picked and chose everything down to the very finest detail how intensely focused he was on finding the fabric for the chairs in the space stations. Yeah, I believe it. No, there, there's usually a lot of hyperbole about a lot of directors, especially if they're considered auteurs and everything. But I think with the film, well, this is one of the things that really caught me off guard. Because this really tackles, I'd say, large themes, but probably the largest themes that humans can grapple with. But also feels very personal. Um, and I, I feel like it does a great job at kind of intoxicating you um, and pulling you in so you can kind of, you're open enough to accept that. And it... I, I almost thought it would feel cold and distant to me, and it didn't. It felt very warm and close to me. You can tell it was babied, almost. It, it was definitely babied, and the way it came into existence is, is sort of striking, considering, uh, you know, the, how how it exists in our in our minds today, and and, and like popular culture. Stanley Kubrick became kind of obsessed with the notion of extraterrestrial beings, and. Uh, he decided he wanted to make um, the first really important science fiction movie. So he fished around to find someone to help him work on the project, and um, he was put into contact with Arthur C. Clarke. The two were... uh, (laughs) They were not necessarily compatible humans, but they were compatible artists. <laughs> uh, when he was, when they first suggested Arthur C. Clarke to him, he said, "He's the nut who lives in a tree." <laughs> um, and when I guess the Arthur C. Clarke's people talked to him about it, and he said he was frightfully interested in working with that enfant terrible. <laughs> Okay. See, this is why I love people who work well creatively together, but that's it, because you get great quotes like that. And the the relationship was a little frosty, and Kubrick at, at times sought uh, other writers to replace him, but no one would, would breach the Arthur C. Clarke trust enough to work with Kubrick on the project. So they were stuck together. They sort of worked independently, but together at the same time. Um, 
Clark gave Kubrick a, his, a bunch of his short works and Kubrick picked uh, a short called The Sentinel that he was most interested in and dealt with um, the discovery of an artifact on the moon that ancient aliens had left behind. So you can see how that channels into 2001. Right. Uh, so they both started throwing ideas back and forth remotely and Kubrick was writing the screenplay. Clark was writing the novel. That's so interesting. They did that at the same time. So that's why there's such great differences between the two works in that they were, but they, they'll admit that um, the screenplay should be by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke, and the novel should be by Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick. I like that. That's a good compromise. I thought that was pretty good. And then you, the, uh, if you want to read, have an interesting read, Arthur C. Clarke published his journals. Oh, is it dishy? Because I do like reading dishy. It's pretty journals. good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, okay. So it, it's about his. It's it's segments of his diary from when he was working on two thousand one. He really. Oh it in, yeah, I'm reading that. I'll read the book and then I'll read that. Yeah. There, there, there are a lot of following books. Have you read any of those? No. No, okay. I have not. I have not. I. W- uh, Maybe a future shame is me finally watching 2010 because I've not watched that film. Oh, I was wondering about that. I have that not watched one it. isn't as lauded as a. It's it's just not. It's more of a narrative. What 16 years between 2001 and 2010? Uh, but I think that's not how math works. <laughs> Even I know that. <laughs> Oh, well played, Stephanie. I do get the impression that you could watch 2010 without having seen. 2001 and not really miss anything it's been on my list for a long time and probably this podcast is is going to make me finally catch up with it you know the guilt and all yeah well that's what the show is about right it is it is it's about the confession and there it is i've confessed oh here's a here's a good segue we're talking about years and not how math works well i took the i took the liberties of writing down every movie with a year as the title every ever i i went through and tried to find all of them golly okay golly. now uh do, what, what let's what rank your top five year movies what, what do you got for me okay you, uh, obviously got class the of 1984 <laughs> class well, of 1999 I, I actually like 99 more than 1984. That's interesting, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, do I know any year movies offhand? We've well, got both 1984s. So you got any of those? 1492? 2046? See, I, I actually have a learning disability with numbers okay. called this calcula and it, it's like dyslexia with numbers and I can't visualize <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, this is terrible. Can we cancel this? Oh, we, we could write it all out of the show. Yeah. Just, qu- just a quick <laughs> no, it's okay. just a, But just you a quick have snip. every single one. Okay, get, I'm going to close my eyes. Give me a few more. Uh, well, there's one million years BC. I counted that one. I uh, haven't seen that. I've only seen the poster in the Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> that's probably good enough. Uh, okay. That's that's the movie. Yeah, you know I mean, you could you could follow up on that if you want. Uh, mm. t- Ten thousand BC. Ooh, I think I'm okay not seeing that one. Yeah, I didn't see that. Uh, oh, I saw 2012, but good lord, I cannot put that in a favorite. No. I love John Cusack, but not that much. No. Uh, so then then I had. Uh, 1776, oh, 1492 and 1776. Okay. Uh, the uh, 1984 from 56, 1984 from 84. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, there's uh, 1900. Obviously, Spielberg. Oh, 90. the the sprawling epic. Yeah, oh, I think it's sprawling epic. Yeah. Uh, Spielberg, uh, 1941. Okay. I think that is unduly picked on. 
It is. It is. And I know how to fix it. Okay. It's just too long. Okay. It it does need a little bit of an editor. No, because he he has a great comedic cast, but then he got really caught up on making everything look very beautiful and authentic, and it does look beautiful and authentic, but the pacing switches to serving that instead of serving the comedy, and that's where he loses it. So it just needs, you know, some good, solid trimming, and you got yourself a a cute little movie there. That could be. Uh, I wrote down 1922, but I don't even know what that is. Sounds familiar. I don't know. Huh. I feel like I can just make something up right now. Like it could be anything. Like I feel like I could say uh, "84 Charing Cross Road" and I, I could get away with even that's an address. Right. Yeah. Because uh, I also have written down 1990 and 1991. I don't know what those are, but they were <laughs> they were on my list. And they're movies. I mean, there ha- there has to be some cool futuristic ones though, like. 3000, the year of the space lizards, or I, something like that. I have 2081. That doesn't even, to me, that doesn't even sound like a notable year. It does, it, no, it, it sounds rather boring. I mean, it, hmm. it's not even going to be an election year. I mean, <laughs> right. No rhythm, no election. No. Come on. Yeah. See, the, the exclamation points. One we did last episode was was a lot more exciting because there's so many exclamation I'm points to get sorry. excited about. It's almost like you went out of your way to find the absolute worst person to ask about your title movies. It's all good. Hey, does Cherry Two Thousand count? It's like a model number, but yeah, you could spin it that. Way. If, you if pity you me know. enough to let me have that? Uh, okay. I, mean, I can it, cry. I can cry very easily. You could, if somebody hadn't seen that movie, you could totally tell them that it was about the year two thousand. Okay, cool. So that that that'll work. It's also like, uh, what was the another John Cusack? Wasn't it John Cusack in fourteen oh eight? But that was the room number. Yeah, right? that's the room number. Yeah. yeah. So you could you could use that one as well. Okay. That's Sam Jackson. I haven't seen the movie in a while. Is that Sam Jackson? Yeah. No, it it holds up. Does it? Yeah. Well, who knew? Um, I, I, I did. Okay, okay, yes. Moving on. Dave, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? No, not at all. I've wondered whether you might be having some second thoughts about the mission. How do you mean? Rumors about something being dug up on the moon. I never gave these stories much credence, but particularly in view of some of the other things that have happened, I find them difficult to put out of my mind. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What are you talking about, Hal? This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. To 2001. 
Uh, it was released on April 3rd, 1968. And would it surprise you to learn that 2001 was the highest grossing movie of 1968? No. But... I would be surprised if it was the highest grossing movie of its opening weekend. It, 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 yeah, you got it there. Um, it, it Word of mouth uh, did big business for 2001. Also the word of many, many, many stoners. Oh, yeah. Now, I can imagine you going in opening weekend like, oh, fun, a space movie. Mm-hmm. And then sitting there yelling at the projectionist. And they're like, no, it's right. And they're like, no, no, bloke, it's not right. And he's like, oi, it's right. <laughs> so they're like sitting there very grumpy. And finally it starts and yeah, losing a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But then you have like one philosophy major in the back who's mm-hmm. baked out of his mind. And, he, and at the end he's like, oh, I saw a god. I got to tell right. everybody. Yeah, it, it was it was well documented too. The the. I believe they called them funky cigarettes in the in the news clipping I read. <laughs> funky cigarettes. I've, yeah, I've I've heard jazz cigarettes too. Jazz cigarettes. Hmm. Hmm. Or was that heroin? It, it was something. Jazz I've definitely cigarette. heard that term though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so regarding the walking out segment, uh, Kier Dule said that in the New York premiere, more than two hundred fifty walked two hundred fifty people walked out of the movie. Wow. <laughs> and uh, Rock Hudson reportedly left the LA premiere saying, What is this bullshit? That was straight from the Wikipedia page, so you know it's true. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. The, the critics. Yeah, Rock, the, the, Rock the, Hudson. No, that. Well, it's it seemed rather judgmental. I mean, you got to. <laughs> come on, Rock. You're going to have to show some acceptance here. True. No, I, I think if most of your life is suppression and Doris Day, that's just a <laughs> lot to take in all of a sudden. I mean, that, so I'm sympathetic yeah. to that. I get that. You know, you go into that movie and, and yeah. Okay. And plaid. Don't forget the plaid. The plaid would. Mm, never. Yeah. Um, the, the critics, likewise, were, were all over the map regarding 2001. Uh, Philip French, the. English critic for The Observer said it was the first super colossal movie since D.W. Griffith's Intolerance. Damn. I mean, that's big. Uh, it's Stanley, big. It's big. Stanley Kaufman of The New Republic, a film that is so dull, it even dulls our interest in the technical ingenuity. Wow. And to a fellow Stanley, no less. I know. Renata Adler of The New York Times, somewhere between hypnotic and immensely boring. That was that was the takeaway from her review. <laughs> Meanwhile, Roger Ebert gave it a glowing review and included it in his top ten favorite movies of all time. He gave it four out of four stars. The Boston Globe called it the world's most extraordinary films. Later on, Sight and Sound uh, named it uh, number six of all time. I believe that was in both the 2002 and 2012 list. AFI number 15, AFI number Wait, one not sci-fi. 2001. Unfortunately, I do not believe they did one of those lists in 2001. They weren't timely. They weren't timely. There's not symmetry anymore. No. Mm-hmm. AFI said the number one sci-fi. They gave Hal the number 13 villain, which, you know. Um, listed on the AFI greatest quotes, open the pod bay doors, Hal. Even the Vatican claimed it as one of its top 45 films. Now, I didn't do further research to explain why it was top 45 or why the Vatican has a list of, of favorite movies. Yeah, I didn't know that existed. <laughs> I just liked the absurdity of that statement. I will be looking up the Vatican film list. After. Because I really <laughs> want to know, I mean, okay, of all the movies that were made, it picked 45 and 2001 is on there. What did the Pope like about 2001? <laughs> uh, I wonder if the passion of Joan of Arc is on that list. Um. <laughs> oh yeah. We're getting sassy. The, uh, the other, th- I, I did find this funny. The other, the top four movies from 1968, 2001 with 54 million. Number two, Funny Girl. 
52 million. Boy, that that was a big trip. That was the year, wasn't it? Oh, that yeah. whole time period where, like, we should still be making bloated musicals, right? Yeah. Well, probably not. People are liking these existential space movies and, like, hippies out on the road and people sitting in rooms drinking coffee and talking. Yeah, but, you know. Funny girl. And then we can make Hello Dolly soon, and I think that'll go over well. <laughs> <laughs> Number three is The Love Bug. Okay. <laughs> this is great. I know. I, I love this list. And number four was The Odd Couple. <laughs> so it's like you're, you're shaken to your core, and these are everything you watch right afterwards oh. to kind of get back to your normal baseline. Yeah, this is that's the recovery period, this funny girl Love Bug and The Odd Couple. That's amazing. I really like that. Well, I go into businesses every day, and it's been my experience. These machines can be a metaphor for whatever's on people's minds. Because they're afraid of computers? Yes. This machine is frightening to people, but it's made by people. People aren't frightening? It's not that. It's more of a cosmic disturbance. This machine is intimidating because it contains infinite quantities of information, and that's threatening. Because human existence is finite. But isn't it godlike that we've mastered the infinite? Do you, do you want to talk about the what actually happens in the movie? Uh, sure. What, I think that's important. I, 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 you know, I don't know that it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it might help to, ha- to have a, a baseline understanding. And I think it goes without saying that there will be spoilers. Even the most spoileriest of spoilers means nothing outside the context of the film. So even if you haven't seen it, I encourage Which you just to Which was kind of what I was saying, because you were talking to me about the right. star baby. and But I, I'm telling you, um, I think everything that I've had, quote unquote, spoiled for me or seen probably made up like 15% of the movie. And once you see it in context, it's like I never saw it referenced before at all. So And it's yeah. about how it's about how the pieces fit together. It still doesn't mean anything on its own. Absolutely. Yeah. This is not a movie that lives and dies by the narrative. Oh, no. Uh so we we open with a three minute overture. And mm-hmm. then no MGM Lion War, just the MGM Lion logo. No, this is when the projectionist is getting yelled at. Yeah, already, before the movie even starts. It's like, where's the Lion Roar, you jerk? <laughs> and then we have uh, a little classical music to tide us over. Which I love, because it makes me feel so smart. Also, Sprock Zarathustra. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm leading up to the sequence called The Dawn of Man. Which involves the aforementioned uh, apes, uh, early man, hominids, I believe they they would be called. Oh, I'm sorry. Congratulations. Right. Thank you. Uh, That's the anthropology class I nearly flunked in college. (laughs) I will say, what a what a wonderfully audacious way to begin a space movie. <laughs> it is. It, re- it really is. To, to ground it in the most primal uh, of human relations. Uh, there's a monkey tribe. I'm sorry. It's, re- it, it, it's mean to say monkeys. The hominid tribe um, is forced out of its watering hole by a more aggressive tribe. And then we have the operatic cacophony while... Uh, the monkeys discover the monolith. So these, these banished, the Spanish tribe of hominids comes across the monolith and touches it. They have this very spiritual moment with this rectangular, shiny black door. Yeah. It really is like dropping a giant piece of Apple technology within, you know, a desert. And again, even in commercials, it's been, parodied so often mm-hmm. but they do a great job it's just so quiet it's such a great build that that stark contrast is so effective the i credit the score for that too the mm-hmm. absolutely the the i mean the power of that oh, 
it, it really does shake you. It, it takes you out of your comfort zone, too. It, it's hard to... You're talking about the parody, and it's it's really easy to disengage from all of that in the movie because there's just nothing else like it. Then the hominids just magically, not magically, they, they discover, <laughs> we because it's not magic. I can't, I can't say that. They discover. There's a Tinkerbell sound effect. <laughs> and it says, I will grant you your wish of evolution. I want to use tools. <laughs> he picks up a tool, he picks up a bone, a taper bone, presumably, because that's what's around. And he learns how to bash the bones and start popping around, and then he smashes the skull, and this is the emergence of human violence on screen. We've reached the next evolutionary stage, the innate violence of man. And great. We discovered jerks. It's it's because of the monolith. <laughs> Blame Stanley Kubrick. So then he takes that bone and proceeds to retake their watering hole. It's a sad little watering hole, too. It is, but if it's all you know. No, I, I'm just trying to paint a picture how brutal everything it's is. It's like if know? the only talking horse movie you knew was Hot to Trot. Fred and Don speak the same language. I'm going to move in with you. They share the same apartment. <laughs> and they both act <laughs> like animals. There's a horse in here. Bob Goldthwait, Daphne Coleman, and Don. I speak human, giraffe, whale, humpback, and sperm. Hot to trot. Honestly, really does talk. It's a pleasure to meet you. Rated PG. Starts Friday, August 26th. Damn. <laughs> Maybe the best analogy <laughs> I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> and then the, the hominid Horse tosses. Flies. To- hey now <laughs> tosses the bone into the air and you have this wonderful match cut with the flying bone as weapon turning into a nuclear satellite and you have the escalation and the evolution of violence from bashing a monkey head to nuclear satellites orbiting the earth prepared to destroy all of creation yeah you can put some fancy highfalutin knobs on your lizard brain, but it's still a lizard brain. That's true. And then at 25 minutes into the movie, we have our first bit of dialogue. And I'm pretty sure it has something to do with Blue Lady's cashmere sweaters being found in the restroom. I was just going to say, after all that, you think the first line would be up there. And you could instantly recall and be famous as hell, but it, mm-hmm. I don't think it is. No. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not about the the lady's cashmere sweater but that that is playing in the background as he's walking around the the satellite is there that announcement over the I guess it's a PA system. I mean, they probably have a better name for it, but they didn't tell me. Well, they seem to like to use only three letters to describe a lot of the systems there, so PAS. Okay. That'll work. Yeah, I'm ready for the future. I had something profound to say, and you just spoke right over it. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk on your podcast. Um, it was very rude of me. It had something to do with the cashmere sweater, so don't be too forlorn. I'm sure it, it, to be broadcast over the, the PAS system, it must have been a fabulous cashmere sweater. Or maybe, or but it couldn't have been too fabulous, because whoever found it would have just taken it for themselves. True. Now I'm wondering if there's dry cleaning, or if there's just... They're so advanced, you don't need to worry about separating it. It kind of looked like dirt was a thing of the past in that space station. Mm, true, yeah. No, you know, it's probably really hard not to always have little floating dust particles all the time. Yeah. Wow. The things we take for granted. Just our constant filth. <laughs> Hold on to your filth, everybody, because it ain't in the future. Sure, you got your cashmere. But can the cashmere get under your fingernails? Mm -hmm. I don't think Mm -hmm. so. What are we talking about? 
we got derailed but, by the the cashmere which it happens but that's one of the most amazing things about this film i think you can get derailed at any point on this film because it's just so big and it's so wide open and i i think that's wonderful you can just take any weird path off it and i think it's still interesting i think that's why even today people are still publishing works about it and film students don't seem to feel it's like a passe thing to learn it's still like blowing minds it is and speaking of cashmere have you seen lord love a duck because that a great movie no, it's about duck who wears little cashmere sweaters. Cause it, is about, it is about cashmere. What, what kind of color is that, okay. baby? Oh, Grape, Grape yum yum. yum. <laughs> oh, oh, look at this. Oh. Banana bay. Oh, no. <laughs> would you oh. like to slip one on for size? Would you? Oh, would I? Yes, <laughs> yes. There's, there's a lot of cashmere. You should you should definitely watch Lord Love. This is like a weird, gross, sad movie. It's like super artsy. It's Roddy McDowell. It's not. It's not artsy. Bit of black comedy. It's like. It's like pre Heather's. Okay, I used. I, there's a book I read when I was a kid where they picked on a girl because she only had four dresses. Like you only have four dresses. I can't believe. It. Is it like that? Is it like the four dress girl? Except with cashmere, cashmere sweaters. Right. Right. Okay. I don't have any lifelines for this part of the podcast. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, we're, and we're both not feeling very well either no, so i no. feel like we could very easily get pulled down <laughs> into a terrible okay. quagmire i think I, I think it happened i think that was I, I hope that's the that's the quagmire and then we'll just nothing but intelligence from here on out i hope after you edit this is going to be half an hour have it come out to be half an hour and then it's like a two-hour <laughs> director's cut i'll edit all this out anyway who cares <laughs> I'll just go to my next note. How's that? Great. <laughs> oh, this it's it's good podcast, right? That's what I tell myself. Uh, <laughs> it's my, good podcast. It's good podcast. My next my next note has something to do with Red Dwarf. I don't know. Anyway, we'll try that again. <laughs> good evening, Dave. How you doing, Hal? Everything's running smoothly, and you? Oh, not too bad. Have you been doing some more work? A few sketches. May I see them? Sure. That's a very nice rendering, Dave. I think you've improved a great deal. Can you hold it a bit closer? Sure. That's Dr. Hunter, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. By the way, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? No, not at all. Well, forgive me for being so inquisitive. But during the past few weeks, I've wondered whether you might be having some second thoughts about the mission. How do you mean? Well, it's rather difficult to define. Perhaps I'm just projecting my own concern about it. I know I've never completely freed myself of the suspicion that there are some extremely odd things about this mission. I'm sure you'll agree there's some truth in what I say. So at at one hour, we're introduced to HAL 9000, the latest product of machine intelligence, recreates the functions of a human brain. And we are told that no 9000 computer has ever mistake. And even Hal says we are foolproof and incapable of error. Has never mistake. Has this never, is how we get Hal nine thousand. Has ne- Yep. <laughs> you cannot edit that. Out. Nope. I got. It's just gonna sit there. <laughs> Podcast ever. Now my cat is pulling the computer cords. <laughs> is trying to pull the computer off. Stop it! Humanity's unraveling. The film has finally reached its ultimate form. Oh. <laughs> we are experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by.
now return you to the Cinema Shame broadcast, inexplicably still in progress. Is it Frank? Haywood? Hal <laughs> <laughs> <Well>, 9000? <laughs> Hal's, Hal's, Hal's cousin, Skip. I'm the friendly computer. <laughs> I won't turn on you. I never. Open the pod doors. I've made you a cake. <laughs> this podcast will never see the light of day. Somebody needs to be the first to just jabber on about cashmere. We did get stuck on cashmere for quite a long time. <laughs> it's like, okay, Edward, it's, I really, down. I really wish, I really wish you, you were knowledge about Lord Love a Duck, and then we could just. Zoop, Right over on that I'm, tangent, okay, and we could just. Okay, you know what? We're done tonight. We, we go just watch the duck movie. Abandoned. I'll come back. <laughs> go just abandon 2001. I know everything hasn't been quite right with me, but I can assure you now, very confidently, that it's going to be all right again. I feel much better now. I really do. Look, Dave. I can see you're really upset about this. I honestly think you ought to sit down calmly, take a stress pill and think things over. I know I've made some very poor decisions recently. But I can give you my complete assurance that my work will be back to normal. I've still got the greatest enthusiasm and confidence in the mission. And I want to help you. And this is above all the other scenes, everything else that happens in the movie, this particular scene where he's removing Hal's memory is by far the most affecting thing in the movie. I find it mesmerizing uh, the way it's shot, the, the colors, the reaction of Hal. And as Dave slowly removes his memory, he reverts to very human response. He starts he's pleading. He starts begging him not to remove the memory, and and he's 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 trying to bargain with him. He says, um, "Look, Dave, I wrote this down because I was like I got to write the whole thing down. I never remember it all because the the way it the way it unfolds, I found to be so interesting." He says, "Look, Dave, I can see you're really upset about this." He's acknowledging emotion. Um, so take a stress pill and think things over. I know I've made some very poor decisions recently, but I can give you my complete assurance that my work will be back to normal. Dave, stop. And this is when he begins to plead. Stop, stop, will you? And, and now it, Hal's tone changes again. He says, I'm afraid my mind is going. I can feel it. My mind is going. There's no question about it. That this infallible computer was capable of expressing all these different emotions as he's coming to his own end. Right. It's played like a human death scene and he's really just talking to this blinking light in this very claustrophobic space. Um, But I, I agree. If if it was, if Hal was an old man on a deathbed, it, it does kind of have that emotional impact which it's saying something. <laughs> it is. And that the, the making Hal, making Hal the villain here is, is also uh, an interesting setup because you're then implicating once again, humanity, uh, the humanity that created this computer and then ceded all control to the computer. Exactly. Yes. So yeah, we've it, been we've been warning ourselves about that for a long time, and we have been ignoring it for we, just as long. Yeah. Then Hal starts singing. 
he reverts back to his earliest piece of programming, which was the song Daisy Bell. My instructor was Mr. Langley, and he taught me to sing a song. If you'd like to hear it, I can sing it for you. Yes, I'd like to hear it, Hal. Sing it for me. It's called Daisy. 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 Give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy. All for the love of you. It's, it's such Most a wholesome, sweetest little right. simple thing. It's just such a simple old song. Fashioned. And it's interesting in that you no, know, Kubrick has denied the connection to IBM because Hal is one letter removed from each of the letters in IBM. Right. I thought that was interesting. Um, but Daisy theory. Bell was also the first was a song that IBM programmers taught an IBM computer to sing like that. That mm-hmm. was the first, first song computer sang. So, and then uh Bender sang it on Futurama. Oh yes. So. Yes. Robots really like that song. I don't know what it is about the song. It's but, my thesis. Thank mm-hmm. you. What do you think about Hal as the Frankenstein monster? Uh, that's a very apt comparison to make. I think. Yeah, it's, because of Frankenstein's monster, he was pretty much nonverbal, and Hal is only verbal. So they're on polar opposites in that way, but it kind of keeps us at the same distance away from each of them. So it's making us as the audience do the work to bridge that gap, because at this point, we have this, okay, so we... He's basically everywhere. He's this voice. He's perfect. He's not human. But something about that warm, calming voice. And you know he's important even before this part of the plot starts ramping up. Something about him, you just, you want to know him. You want to kind of maybe just pick up some humanity and try to get it to stick to him. And I think that's why that scene you pointed out uh, was so effective. Cause I mean, honestly, I can only speak for myself, but up until that point, I was trying, I was almost trying to put myself in Hal's place. I'm like, yeah, I I feel betrayed too. And Oh no, how he can't kill people. And, And he's supposed to be, he's supposed to be a reflection of all of human intelligence, basically. Um, so like the Frankenstein monster, they, they created them, they created them from a a conglomeration of, yes, of pieces, except we're, we're talking about an intellectual and, um, a thought process. The, um, why do you think Hal failed? Why do you think, why do you think he made a mistake? I've been thinking about that. Is it because they were too effective at making him just coldly intellectual to the point that if you pair that with human beings, something's going to happen? Or were they not thorough? Were were they like, well, you know, let's give a little space in here. Um, there's still a chance for it to maybe learn and grow. And maybe that, that vulnerability in his programming is what happened and just exploded into maybe a kind of weird robot puberty. <laughs> I, I can kind of see it going either way. So I, I, I was thinking about this by my last viewing and I kept going back to the, the human fallibility And as a machine created by humans, it would still maintain the ability to fail because of the human element involved. 
But that didn't necessarily explain failure in that moment. Maybe it was the mission operative because he lied to the space guys. <laughs> right. And that, oh, no, the, the robot's gone evil. Let's throw the logical fallacy in its brain to stop it, it. Hal doesn't go, you know, he is not the rogue robot who who malfunctions and this is no. this isn't chopping mall. He's still functioning as he believes is proper for the mission because he believes that the human lives are expendable if the mission is carried out successfully. But something breaks at the end. I don't think that we as viewers of the movie can know exactly how the how or why the computer failed and he presents it to you in a way that there's multiple explanations and there's multiple interpretations and there's really no answer. I appreciate that about this film. And I know he famously didn't really like to talk too deeply on the film. He didn't really want to explain it to people, especially today when we instantly know everything about a film. There's instantly like a ton, like, Dozens and dozens of articles and videos nitpicking a trailer yeah. apart. The fact that um, this has existed for decades and we're still sitting here trying to figure it out is kind of a, not sound cheesy, but really is kind of like a beautiful gift for a film to give people. It is. And, and you can take it away even in, in different stages of your life. Like I've taken different things away and read the movie differently. Every time I've watched it, and I've probably watched it every like six or eight years. Oh, that's interesting. It, it, it always feels different to me. Oh, that's wonderful. The flip side to this is that as Arthur C. Clarke wrote his novel, he did more expl explaining. Well, of course. Right. This is science fiction. The, <laughs> I mean, you're also dealing with a very different medium that's, that's going to need to put mm -hmm. some more context around these these specific images. I, so, I love that because <laughs> Kubrick is such a visual storyteller. <laughs> and this is much more of a visual film than it is anything else. So he went back, he went back and removed I love that. He went back and removed uh, 20 to 30 minutes, I believe, after the first screening of the film. Was to, it all dialogue? It was all dialogue, basically. Yeah. Is what I read. <laughs> I'm not surprised. He removed he removed a bunch of exposition about Hal that would have oh. that would have explained more to this, I believe. Um and more about the mission. Uh, and then some of the end that explains more well more context for the end. Um so each time he removed, he did so with the explicit intent of leaving it further wide open for discussion. Kubrick said about the film, it's basically a visual nonverbal experience that hits the viewer at an inner level of consciousness, just as music does or painting. The difference between the movie and then how the book treats it. They, the book does give some more context for Hal um, saying that it was the lie that triggers the malfunction because it's not a specific part of fallibility it's not um it's not infallible or fallible it doesn't fall into one or the other because a lie a lie is at once uh not according to protocol but it's also meant meant to meet a specific end that would have and been the successful mission and right that, and that caused him to malfunction yeah it's a deeply, deeply human trait. How the hell is he supposed to process that? Well, clearly couldn't. Well, we saw. I agree with uh, what, well, I agree with what the filmmaker said about the film he made. <laughs> but I, I really wasn't expecting that because with uh, genre films, I am very much used to seeing either space adventures or hard science fiction. And I, I went in assuming this would be hard science fiction, and it's definitely much closer to that if you were going to have to put in a little box. Um, I had no idea it would be so artistic, poetic. I didn't know 
how emotional I would feel about it. I I was very stirred. And then I I heard that Kubrick spent a lot of time with poets and musicians and painters and and I think that's such an important part of why his his work stands out the way it does and why it has the kind of impact it does. And the way this movie came together was really a meeting of, of sort of the top minds because you had you had Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke and he even he consulted Carl Sagan about space life and how it would evolve. Uh, Carl Sagan said that at, at early in the project, Kubrick um, was really set on using some sort of humanoid alien um, for storytelling convenience. And um, <laughs> Carl Sagan warned him that it would uh, quote unquote, introduce an element of falseness <laughs> And that they wouldn't look anything like a human if he was really looking at this from a scientific perspective. Good and call, Sagan. I know, right? And he said Hey, that, off topic. Yeah. What did you think of AI? I don't remember it. I saw it in the theater and it, it totally there didn't you know. it didn't register. <laughs> He, Sagan said the movie should just suggest extraterrestrial super intelligence rather than depict it, which I thought, I mean, that's really what, how 2001 actually comes together because you're not given alien form to put all of this onto it, it's, it's spiritual as a result, the, the meditation that you get with this film you're not taken out of out of the experience because you're treated to some hokey alien because no matter what you can do it'll never it'll never sit right with a viewer in this context that's that's wonderful and i think that's you know part of the fabric that makes it such a important film because that's so antithetical to filmmaking tell don't show don't show it to them and you would kind of have to go to someone who's mainly a writer to kind of give you that note but convince you of why and they're right and i'm sure that's something he must have struggled with yeah, as, a, as a filmmaker i don't care if you you if you are standing no kubrick, kubrick don't show something hmm. Trust, yes, trust the audience. Trust the audience to make the trust leaps the that you're you're going to force <laughs> them to take at the end of this film. So let's pick it up. After, so now we've dealt with Hal. Dave has disconnected Hal, and he's going to finish the mission on his own. Which is, it was a juxtaposition of all sorts of images, um, paintings, and scenery, and collage of. Everything. <laughs> I don't, I, there's, there's not really one way to put it uh, of what, what comes flying at him. I'm sure that's another image you'd seen before, the, the images flying off the mask. Right. Um, and I, I'm glad I saw it in context because it's, oh, cool. That looks neat. Wow, they made that when? But seeing in context, it, it got to me. So we, we get through this this image barrage and suddenly he's in some sort of neoclassical living room in the pod. It's stunning by the way. It's like he's living in a beautiful Parisian cake. And if you're not, if you're not into the movie, if you're not on the movie's wavelength, this is when you go, Oh, enough of this shit. Nope. You, you, you are you out. are Rock Hudson, and yeah. you are out of there. Yeah, the movie still has given you no reason, or it's given you no grounding for any of this. All you know is that he's going to Jupiter. No, explain the plot in detail. Every beat, and then he becomes Star Baby. <laughs> it's just not that kind of film. It's not that kind of it's film. Like, and then she murdered the nanny. It's just not that kind of film. It's not no. What does this movie make you feel in that final in that final moment? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Are you sad? Are you happy? What what is that emotion? Are, are, is this like the royal we, or do you want to know personally? What did you feel? 
Me personally, I'm optimistic in general. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's how I felt because we we kept getting these introductions. You have the monolith in the beginning and that begat violence pretty quickly. And this is kind of the closing chapter of this. It, it's almost like, okay, you know what? We're going to start clean. This is a brand new slate. Um, you know, you're, you're a pure giant weird baby now. Uh, we're going to give you another chance. Um, and if, if you're cynical, then you'll probably just see it as like the, the vicious cycle. But it, it, it's beautiful and it's peaceful. So I, I take it as an ending, like a beautiful, weird, poetic, happy ending. I, I read it. I read it similarly. He removed a segment that really <laughs> was the baby thing. I bring you love. Sort of. So. Oh no. <laughs> I read. I read it as rebirth. Um, we've we've transcended the human form, and going back to that original nuclear satellite that's orbiting Earth, the Star Baby was originally was originally going to wipe out all of the nuclear satellites. It was going to erase them. So it was kind of like timeliness really intruding on the plot. Kubrick removed it because he didn't want to carry over the nuclear themes from strange love. Mm. So that was the, that was the initial conceit behind the star baby, which I think is really too specific i i don't like it and i'm i'm glad it's not there anymore and this ending as it sits is it's profoundly moving without being able to put a specific label on why it's the music and where this is all led to Right. And no, and no, we don't under, We don't really understand it. And anyone who says that they can explain the ending of two thousand one to you is lying. We can talk about it, and we can we can express how it makes us feel. But the way two thousand one ends is not something that I think you can really pin down. No, I think more than any film I've ever seen, this invites projection and interpretation. This was a film that was imprinted on the consciousness of everyone who saw it and forced them to talk about it and, more importantly, to think about it. Every viewer has to make up their own mind about what the film is about. They have to make their own connections. The mystery of the obelisk was incredibly provocative. The essential reason is not possible to comprehend intellectually. It is much better to, to leave the end of 2001 and the whole story, in fact, as it stands, unexplained, as a bow to the unknowable. I, I've really enjoyed talking about this movie with you. But if I ran to someone who would argue with me about any kind of viewpoint or emotion I had, I, I would get so angry. I couldn't put up with it, with this movie specifically. <laughs> I couldn't do it. And I I um, inadvertently started a very substantial Twitter thread last month um, when I asked about uh, classic films or cla or classic film elements, actresses, movies that people feel like they're ashamed for not liking. Because I, um, I, I volunteered my less than favorable opinion of Judy Garland, which was just a mistake because I just don't, mm. I don't adore Judy Garland. I am fine with her. I just never seek movies out with Judy Garland. And that started just a weird, just unending tangent. And 2001 came up very frequently as a movie that people just despised and did not get. It's it, it's very common for people to give up on this movie. Or yeah. maybe they just don't, they're not 
willing to go along with it. And I, I, I get it, but I do feel that people should give it at least a second chance. People need to go in with the right frame of mind and you can't try and pin down 2001. You, you can't go in wanting to understand every beat or needing when you start, when you, when you strangle meaning from the film, the meaning becomes lost. It's so weird how much we're on the same page. We usually don't agree on anything, but I'm with you. Um, because I can see, especially you'll see this, especially on social media where people are like, you know what? I I'm finally going to watch this. I have to watch this. I'm sick of everyone making fun of me. I'm going to watch it. And it's almost like they, um, if you're already kind of going in with that mentality and maybe like you have, you still have your phone open, you, you have popcorn going, this isn't a tirade about being distracted when you watch a movie, but with 2001, there, there's no give to that. It's kind of like a hippie who gives you like a new strain of something. (laughs) And he's like, okay, I'm doing this because, I love you and I think you're going to enjoy it, but I really need you to relax into it or it's not going to work for you at all. Mm-hmm. Perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you, you really, you kind of have to go into this film as a space baby, just pure and open and, and gently floating towards it. You can't hang up on me or the host. I'm just letting it all settle in for the (laughs) audience. You know, it's like you don't want to over explain it. You got to let it simmer. See, wasn't that an important bit of simmer? Yeah. Is this the intermission? No. (laughs) (laughs) One more, one more quote from Stanley Kubrick. You're free to speculate as you wish about the philosophical and allegorical meaning of the film. And such speculation is one indication that it has succeeded in gripping the audience at a deep level, but I don't want to spell out a verbal roadmap for 2001 that every viewer will feel obligated to pursue or else fear he's missing the point. That was taken from a 1968 Playboy interview. He's spoken quite a bit about 2001 I think certainly I've noticed more defense from the filmmaker than many of his other films. And it seems to have started right after the release of the film. We read some of the contemporaneous reviews. And he's clearly responding to a lot of that negativity already. And that's a, That's interesting considering how well the film did theatrically. He had a pretty interesting relationship with the film press, didn't he? He did. He he wasn't a big fan of explaining much of anything. No. Yeah, maybe that falls into... I I was watching a special features and they mentioned he was a filmmaker's filmmaker. And uh, like every big filmmaker now, like Spielberg, everyone just absolutely worship him. No question. Um, maybe, and I don't know, maybe that rubs some critics the wrong way. Like, no, I'm going to question you. <laughs> I'm not, you're not getting off that easily. I'm sure it did. And it, towards the end of his career, it certainly added to the, the Stanley Kubrick mystique. He um, went as far as to burn the extra film that was um that he had in his possession oh man for what do you, how do you feel about that when artists like burn their manuscripts or you know things scholars and fans would kill to see but they're like oh it's my creation i do not want you saying it i don't want you using this to recontextualize anything i think uh, with regard to 2001 specifically i it wouldn't have done anyone any favors um I mean, I, I understand the 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 need to unearth this footage and 
and the desire to pick it apart and everyone wants a nice juicy extra on their brand new blu-ray that that's i agree with you i think that's what it would ultimately be for all he knew someone was going to pick it apart and and put it back into the film and call out the extended yeah. cut it would have detracted from the singular cut of this film so in that way i totally get it and in the the greedy fanatic who wants as much 2001 as he can get I I would love to have seen it. I also un- understand that I view these things differently. I think I thought of a, a new super popular Twitter poll, though. Yeah. What filmmaker and what film would you like to go back in time and watch it with the director? And you can see that lost footage for one time before he burns it right burns in it. front of you. Oh. Would you choose 2001? Um... I wouldn't. I don't know. Um, well, do I get films that weren't actually finished? The ones that were just lost to time? and I don't know, because I think I got too specific with him actually burning things now. Oh, he's got it. Okay. <laughs> I don't think Orson Welles was like, burn Ambersons, burn. Because <laughs> I think Ambersons would be the one that I, I want to see the original Ambersons. Yeah, but then he would burn it after. But see, he didn't want to burn it. It's a a very specific like, he question. wanted that. I apologize. Oh, no. It right. doesn't work with Orson Welles, though. Uh, sorry, Twitter. We're, it's not going to work out. Oh. We workshopped it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Train wreck. Cinema score low. <laughs> Cinema sins ding. Oh. <laughs> I had to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I figured I would get a reaction like that, so I had to. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't disappoint. What is Stanley Kubrick's thing with violence? Well, this is absolute madness, Ambassador. Why should you build such a thing? There were those of us who fought against it, but in the end, we could not keep up with the expense involved in the arms race, the space race, and the peace race. And at the same time, our people grumbled for more nylons and washing machines. Our doomsday scheme cost us just a small fraction of what we've been spending on defense in a single year. But the deciding factor was when we learned that your country was working along similar lines and we were afraid of a doomsday gap. This is preposterous. I've never approved of anything like that. Our source was the New York Times. Okay, so you want to know my take on how he viewed violence. Or why it was is well, such a big driving force, right? Generally speaking, what do these what do these three right. films tell us about Kubrick's perspective on violence? I would say that it shows he is very empathetic in a very rare, unusual kind of way, and I where he basically sees how animalistic and greedy, self-destructive, just everything dirty and evil about human beings. And he kind of takes that part and parcel. He doesn't, he never, he's never, at least from what I've seen so far, it's he works with grays. It's not black and white. And I, I I don't think he appreciates things being too easy because he knows that's not how humanity is. It's not easy. There are half measures. It is ugly and messy, but he finds these gorgeous ways of portraying that where they're horrifying, but in a very palatable way. And it does say something about us. We we can really glean a lot from it. It's very truthful, but it's also very artistic. Um, so, of course, he's, he's studied because that's so interesting. There are a lot of filmmakers who are just as obsessed with framing and set design as he is, but they'll kind of gloss over the humanity, the ugliness, and the fact that he can put so much of that forth, even when there's not a lot of dying on. Um, 
incredible. So um, I don't find that he glamorizes violence. He finds it funny. He just looks in the face and says, well, it's there. (laughs) I'm not going to lie and take it out. It's there. I think he's he's very interested in the face value absurdity of the self-destructive tendencies. Okay. And he's, he's looking at it as a, as a cynic, but I don't think he's without hope. And I think that comes through in 2001 most potently Because there, there is, there is future for humanity. And I, I think it's sweet that he put his little daughter in the movie, <laughs> and just a cute little scene. I think yeah. that that kind of adds credence to what you're saying. And uh, I mentioned this. This movie started as sort of a exercise in, in, in genre play. It seems like he decided he wanted to make a sci-fi movie, but it became at least. I think at least through our eyes, it became something very personal. I mean, all his films were come across as something personal to me. Uh, you you can see the affection he he pours into every frame. But this one this one stands out to me in in his filmography. Um, I think because of what we already talked about, uh, but. Also because it sends such a a clear message. So with such a clear message, um, and we both agree on it, why is it so hard for a lot of people to try to interpret that or even just sit down and kind of appreciate it for what it is? People have have trained themselves, I think, to, to view movies a specific way. It's hard to make a you know, blanket statement about everyone that doesn't want to watch 2001, but it's just not a traditional film. And I think that creates a, one barrier. Its reputation also creates another. Right. That And that was kind of what created my shame. People don't want to like it because it's it comes off as pretentious. The, the reputation is pretentious. and Right. Exactly. <laughs> But like that's, pretentious science fiction? Are you kidding me? No, thank you. Right, and I have... I don't love Terrence Malick for those reasons. I like Badlands, and after then I have very mixed feelings about pretty much everything he's done. Fair. Okay. I compare his his work to Kubrick most readily, especially in 2001, I see so much more clarity in 2001 than I do in something like tree of life with just felt excruciating to me. I could see the way his mind was working, but in the end, I just, I couldn't make that connection. Like I, like I do here. It felt like pastiche almost like to to not to reduce it to collage work, scrapbooking. (laughs) Cashmere and scrapbooking. We would we could we could really put together a killer middle school club. <laughs> I started a club in high school. You wanna know what it was? I'll tell you. What? It was a movie club. What? That's right. And not a fashion club? Uh, it was not a cashmere club or a fashion club. The the important part of this anecdote is that for my first task as programmer of the film club, we watched Citizen Kane. The club periods were 15 minutes each. Oh, okay. It took us a so month. I... It took us a month to watch Citizen Kane. What's it like taking a whole month to watch that? I've never tried that before. It doesn't it doesn't really work. I'll, I'll tell you that much. Was it the first time you saw it? Oh, no, no. Okay. I I thought if I'm going to start a film club, I'm going to start with Citizen Kane. I think we watched, I think we finished a total of three movies in a year. That's amazing. Did you get to 2001? No. Oh, 
I don't Probably even remember. The best. <laughs> I don't even remember what happened after Citizen Kane. <laughs> Well, I, I think this is probably the greatest discussion of 2001 at Space Odyssey of all time. Most I definitely. say very humbly. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that anything that wasn't spoken was done so for a reason. Right. It was an implied seed we implanted in l- the listener's head mm-hmm. so they could nurture it. And then eventually grow up to become star babies of their own. Yes, you you don't want to force the star baby birth process. No, it needs to take its own time. Oh, it's ugly. I mean, <laughs> are you just like rubbing your temples <laughs> and trying to hold back tears at this point? <laughs> the headphones are currently blocking the temples, so I guess they're doing a little massaging of their own. Okay, I don't think it's bad though. I no, think it I think, got a little messy, but I don't think it's bad. No, I, I think it's going to be good podcasting. And whatever that term means can vary from episode <laughs> to episode. We got there. We we struggled, but we got there. I think we earned <laughs> we earned some sort of merit badge tonight. Oh, that's why you want to start the club. Okay, got oh, it. Oh, well, we need a sash, so. I was a Girl Scout. I was a Wee Below Dropout. Is that an anime club? That's the weird. <laughs> that's the weird segment of like. There's a year between Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, and they're called Weebelows. I did not know that. There you or go. Or maybe I did way back then. I have not heard that term. It's because nobody bothers. I don't know. I just like saying because I'm Weebelow dropout. I'm like, what? I'm like, <laughs> It doesn't matter. They told me I need to learn how to change a tire. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> Bye. Weebelows. What kind of name is that? Yeah. Um, I guess I should end it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, the like, bow on. Put, a, put a capper on here. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> you, you don't have to thank I, me. I for mean, that. no, I, I do. I, I definitely do. This was an experience like. <laughs> None other. It's attributable <laughs> to you. It's attributable to Stanley Kubrick. It's a... and yet nothing at the same time because it's space. And I'm going to go touch a monolith, and that sounded really bad. But <laughs> maybe your cat will finally respect you. He's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> We've learned nothing. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go watch Who's Harry Crumb now and cleanse my palate. <laughs> I'm probably gonna put on Spaceballs. Spaceballs. <laughs> that's more. That's that's a more logical segue. I... Pardon me, sir. I have an idea. Corporal, get me the video cassette of Spaceballs the movie. Yes, sir. Colonel Sanders, may I speak with you, please? Yes, sir. How can there be a cassette of Spaceballs the movie? We should be making it. Oh, that's true, sir. But there's been a new breakthrough in home video marketing. Yes, yes. Instant cassettes. They're out in stores before the movie is finished. Here it is, sir. Spaceballs. Good work, Corporal. I just had Who's Harry Crumb out at it. Hey, John, little, Can- John, John Candy, Candy a, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Brings everyone together. I am the Jules Delioche. Oh, could okay. you spell that, please? I'm... I don't think so. Try it with a D. So, uh, you signed up for Eyes Wide Shut, I hear. That's good. No, certainly didn't do that. <laughs> oh, the, the Arthur C. Clarke diary is called Lost <laughs> Worlds of 2001. I couldn't. I couldn't pull that information from my brain earlier. <laughs> All right, Stephanie, this this was great, no matter what you think. And uh, don't you lie to me, man. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I'm, I'm sure <laughs> it'll it'll be a plus, pure gold, top notch. Oh God, Cashmere. you're addicted to lying.
got well no mean Who like Pauline who thought absurd Sold the birds, claim the famous Harold Ramis Was the greatest director in the history of cinema You have chosen wisely